Hello and welcome. This is the 11th, the final lecture. You are watching it in the week when the April examination period has started. Uh, sorry about that. I had some issues over the weekend, so instead of uploading it on Sunday, as I promised, I'm uploading it on Monday. So be that as it may, uh, Two important announcements. So uh, don't confuse the April examination period with the June examination period. If you look on our website, you may see that there is gate two exam on April, no, sorry, May the 30th. That's not actually the June exam, that's the delayed April exam. So this is not the day when you have the midterm and the exam. No, you will have another date and that is going to be sometime in June. We don't know yet when. So uh, more about that also in the presentation. So let's go into the presentation. As I mentioned, this is our 11th lecture and officially our timeline is slightly Divergent from the original plan. This is now officially the April exam period, but we will have this final, let's say, presentation on the exam itself. So uh, this is the end of the road. The road before us is shorter than the road behind, but also what lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters to compared to what lies within us. So it's not really important when you take this exam, it's important that you have hopefully gained full understanding of the traditional view of grammar and the basic classification of sentence elements, parts of speech, phrases and clauses. So now in June, we don't know exactly when, you will have your midterm and exam together. First, you will have a shortened midterm. So all the exam questions that I showed you and you can find on YouTube will be there, but the quantity will be slightly smaller to accommodate a 60 minute time slot instead of a 90 minute time slot. Then you will not get out of the classroom you will continue with your written exam and it will take another 90 minutes. And then after 2.5 hours, you will be allowed to leave. So what I'm actually saying here is that you will not be allowed to go out before the end of the exam. Why? Because if you want to get out, you will have to squeeze you know, squeeze past one of your colleagues or maybe not to squeeze past one. Maybe uh, you will have to squeeze past three or four or five or six of your colleagues. And that's the opposite of social distancing. So you've seen, if you're following the news, what happens in short proximity when people, you know, exchange vapors, <laughs> let's call it that way, uh, what's happening in the factories in Vranje, for example. So it is not okay for you to be squeezing past other students. And that's why you will enter one by one and you will exit one by one in an orderly fashion. So make sure before the midterm and the exam that you have taken care of your let's say bodily needs and that you don't have to go out to the toilet during the exam. Now, very briefly, uh, what we talked about uh, in the previous two lectures was the end of the simple sentence, concord and negation and the introduction to complex sentences. And when we talk about complex sentences, the most important thing was for you to let's say, become acquainted with the classification of clauses, which are the building blocks of complex sentences. So we discussed the status, structure and function as criteria for classifying clauses. 
when it comes to the status, there are subordinate and superordinate. So uh, superordinate, we call them independent or main clauses and subordinate or dependent clauses. When it comes to structure, uh, clauses can be finite, non-finite, whether they are infinitive or participial. And finally, uh, due to syntactic compression, they can be also verbless. However, uh, this is not the whole story. Uh, when you classify dependent clauses according to their function, you can notice that clauses belong to several groups. If they function as subjects, objects, and complements, which are syntactic functions usually realized through noun phrases, these clauses are called nominal clauses. Sometimes clauses function as adverbials. In that case, they are called adverbial clauses. But as you know, uh, clauses are not necessarily sentence elements. They are not necessarily subjects, objects, complements, and adverbials. They can be also parts of other phrases. And then they are called relative clauses if they are inside noun phrases, if they define directly or indirectly uh, the head noun of the noun phrase. They can be also a positive clause if they are really comments that are not directly and inherently related to the head of the noun phrase. But that's not the end of story. Sometimes clauses, even inside noun phrases, are also comparative clauses. Uh, although typically comparative clauses are uh, found in adjective phrases and adverb phrase phrases. Now, uh, when we talk about that, we have to mention that uh, sometimes in your workbook you'll see that uh, prepositional phrases are also called, called by clauses and they can be also nominal clauses. But the important thing here is how to tell apart relative clauses and a positive clauses. It uh, was brought up um, as a topic during office hours last week. So let's look at some examples. The problem that now arises seems to be serious. The problem that economics is getting worse seems to be serious. The first one is relative. Uh, and the second one is a positive. Why? Because the a positive causes are clauses where the pronoun that cannot be replaced by a WH pronoun. And the noun to which the clause is attached is not included in the internal structure of the clause. You see, there's this economics. Uh, that's not included in the internal structure of the um, I mean, it is the economics is a different topic than the problem, right? Uh, in the first one, the problem that now arises, the problem is the problem that arises in a way. But uh, in the second one, the problem is actually economics. So the noun cannot be repeated in this case. And we also discussed a topic which is really important for the oral exam, and that's the structural deficiencies of non-finite clauses. As a summary and as preparation for the oral exam, you should always be aware that non-finite dependent clauses usually have no subject-verb agreement. Not actually usually, they never have subject-verb agreement. Sometimes they have a subject, but there's no agreement. They cannot express tense, mood, and modality. Often they have no subordinator. Very often they are subject to syntactic compression. So you delete the subject and you delete the verb and you end up with sometimes even verbal clauses. And subject, although it can, it is usually omitted, sometimes uh, it can be, uh, you know, um, also overt. So usually it's implied, but it can be overt. And finally, subordinate clauses may cause ambiguity. 
Then we also discussed a topic that is relevant for complex sentences, but on the surface it is maybe not related. So we talked about clauses of condition. Why did we talk about that? First of all, because all conditional clauses are actually complex sentences. And on top of that, because everything that you've been told about conditionals in your primary and secondary school is fundamentally incomplete. There are not just four types of conditionals, A, B, C, and mixed, or type 1, 2, 3, and mixed. There are actually six types of conditionals grouped into two large classes. So the first group are open or real conditionals, and the second group are hypothetical conditionals. What does it mean? Open or real conditionals are those where the conditional clause denotes something that can be fulfilled. You can still hope, there is hope that this will happen. Whereas in hypothetical conditionals, it's just wishful thinking. The condition denoted by the conditional clause is unreal. It cannot be fulfilled. That's wishful thinking in Serbian. That has some syntactic consequences. Open or real conditionals have a free combination of tenses. You can use anything that makes sense. You can mix past with future if he really said that or even worse, uh, even better if he had really said that before he left uh, she will be really angry you can mix the past perfect with the future it just has to make sense uh, in on the other hand in hypothetical conditionals there is a short limited number of possible tense combinations so some examples include if she had really changed the project proposal before you sent it, we will probably not get the funding. Past perfect with future perfect. But had he asked, I would have helped him. And that's the only possibility. And finally, we also talked about classification of subordinate clauses used for reported speech. Why? Because reported speech is fundamentally an instance, a specialized instance, of a complex sentence. The reporting verb is the verb phrase of the main clause, and you have an obligatory subordinate clause which contains the reported verb, so what you're actually talking about, and that's the verb phrase of the subordinate clause. Why is that interesting, syntactically, grammatically? Because when the reporting verb is in the past, you have to do what we call a backshift of tenses and adverbials and even sometimes pronouns and reference. So this tense shift is obligatory in most cases, but when the temporal reference of the reported verb is in the present or future or it's universally applicable, the backshift is optional. You remember the example that I gave you with King Leonidas, uh, who you can say the King Leonidas said that no man is supposed to fear his life when he's defending freedom. So he actually normally would say that no man was supposed to be afraid, but because this is universally true, you can keep it in the present tense, even in the reported speech. Okay, let's now go back to reality. So our focus for today is some loose ends in terms of complex sentences and then the overview of the final exam, the written exam and the oral exam. So the loose ends uh, are, let's say, just one peculiar group of subordinate clauses. So this uh, was the focus of uh, several questions I had during my office hours last week. So some students asked me about comparative clauses. So 
Uh, I agree, this is not uh, straightforward. It's very simple to recognize the nominal clause and the adverbial clause, even rel relative clause, but comparative clauses are sometimes difficult to recognize. Uh, why? Because they have some weird structural properties, especially when they are non-finite. So, uh, to understand that uh, actually means that we have to reuse the concept which I briefly described on two occasions in the previous lectures, and that's syntactic compressions. So, Many comparative clauses that you see in the post-modification of adverb phrases and adjective phrases do not look like clauses. Why? Because they are the result of syntactic compression or ellipsis. So, nobody speaks English better than Chuck Norris. You can say that this is a PP than Chuck Norris. But fundamentally, in your mind, this reads as nobody speaks English better than Chuck Norris does, uh, or than Chuck Norris speaks English. The problem is that syntactic compression always causes ambiguity. Uh, so the more you compress something, the more you are opening up the door for other possible interpretations. And the biggest problem is the, there is then the noun phrase can be interpreted as the subject or the object of the original clause. So he loves the dog more than his wife. Uh, does he love the dog more than he loves his wife or he loves the dog more than his wife loves the dog? Without the context, you don't know uh, whether it's a good marriage or some weird pet, uh, you know, context, uh, con competition for the love of the pet. Uh, in formal context, this usually does not present a problem because you can use a pronoun. So you can say he loves the dog more than her. This means he loves the dog more than he loves his wife or he loves the dog more than she loves the dog. So, in this case, it can be clear. But in informal communication, when you use her in both instances, you can see ambiguity. So, he attacked the government more than we or us. That's okay, but in speech, sometimes it is problematic because people don't use the proper pronoun. And on top of that, something that causes issues with comparative clauses is the comparative item more. Uh, so this is relevant for your exercises where you have to recognize the structure of the phrase, where you have to analyze the parts of speech, etc. So the comparative item more can have up to six different functions and you have to be aware of them in order to avoid issues when you are analyzing sentences. So more is very often a quantifier. Jack has more girlfriends than his brother has, for example. But more can also be the head of a noun phrase when you say more or more of them are at home or then abroad. But you can put a full stop there. More are at home. It's implied than somewhere else. More can also be an adjunct. When you say, I agree with you more than Robert, or I agree with you more than I agree with Robert. More can also be the modifier of the adjective head. When you say his speech was more interesting than I expected it would be. And more can be a modifier of the adjective pre-modifier. So it's like inception. It was a more lively discussion. So lively modifies discussion. So lively is an adjective pre-modifier of the noun discussion. But the adjective lively is itself uh, modified by more. 
So this is an adverb which modifies an adjective. And finally, more can also modify other adverbs. So it's an adverb modifying adverb, something like the time has passed more quickly than last year. So why is that so important? Because uh, when you look at some sentences, you may interpret them incorrectly or you can end up with some weird meaning. So more uh, as a modifier of the adjective had is let's exemplify it here. His speech was more interesting than I expected. So more modifies interesting but it can be also modifier of the adjective pre-modifier. It was a more lively discussion than I expected. It may seem straightforward, but if you don't use this properly, you can end up with some weird sentences because there's a big difference between there are more intelligent monkeys than Herbert and there are monkeys more intelligent than Herbert. So you have to be <laughs> careful whether you are actually praising the intelligence of Herbert the monkey or you're actually saying that Herbert is worse than a monkey in terms of intelligence. And that brings us to your exam, the main topic for today. So as I mentioned in the initial part of the lecture, we don't know when and where the exam is going to be. We are still waiting for the final timetable and the schedule of exams. What we know is that some of you will be in the auditorium. Some of you will be in one or more additional classrooms, depending on how many of you register. Now, speaking of the registration or in Serbian prijava ispita you have to register even if you don't plan to take the written exam why because we need the number of people who will be attending the time slot for the midterm and the exam and as i mentioned you cannot get out of the classroom after the midterm because you will be squeezing next to your colleagues theoretically and post you know as a remote possibility you could be uh, getting infected or if you're asymptomatic you could be infecting somebody else uh, so when you enter the classroom you are leaving the classroom after two and a half hours in the reverse order in which you came into the classroom and for that we need lists in order to have lists you need to register i really apologize about this but that's the only way we can work in this semester because of everything that's happening and we think it's better to actually have this as a single event than to have multiple events where you have to travel multiple times if you are no longer staying in the dorm if you canceled your apartment so if we have a midterm and the exam then you will have to come twice but this way you come just once and you know the number of possible interactions is smaller if your uh, you know parents your grandpas and grandmas are let's say uh, immunologically compromised this way we are reducing the possibility that something could go wrong the oral exam will be uh, about a week after the written exam so let's look at the written exam uh, you can open your workbooks on page 184 there is a sample test from june 2006 nothing has changed in the format of course, you will have a more up-to-date, uh, graphically up-to-date test with, you know, better font, Arial instead of Times New Roman. But uh, fundamentally, it's the same test. There are nine tasks. And in each task, as you know from Grammar 1, there is a minimum. 
it's a, that's there's a score that you must achieve in order to pass the written exam so uh, if you don't reach the minimum number of points in an exercise it doesn't mean that you fail the exam if that number is below 2.5 or 3 depending on how we assess uh, your let's say scores in that particular term we simply deduce that number from your total so let's say you can you scored uh, 65 percent but you didn't reach 2.5 minimum in one exercise so you instead of 2.5 you have zero you didn't do the exercise in that case we take those 2.5 uh, away from your final score so instead of let's say 65 you get 62.5 uh, and that's it. Uh, but if you uh, fail to meet this minimum for more than three points, so if you are more than three points below the minimum in one or several exercises, then unfortunately you fail. Uh, so let's move in to and talk about the exam. So the first exercise is something that we practiced in uh, practice classes but virtually uh, so uh, it's about transforming the nouns into verbs and making other necessary changing so for example this beverage has an awful taste don't you think uh, so taste has to become a verb so you say this beverage tastes awful not awfully that's the whole point this is mostly about adverbs and adjectives the judge ruling on that case was just so ruling should become a verb so the judge ruled on that case justly Bob's answer to the teacher's question, so answer is a noun, it becomes a verb. Bob answered the teacher's question more than sensibly. Uh, the whole point here is to always use the adverb if there is an adverb or an adjective if there is an adjective. You are only allowed to say in a particular way or manner if it's not possible to derive a corresponding uh, adverb so mr smith re uh, mr smith reaction was quite dramatic mr smith reacted quite dramatically uh, and finally this is where uh, you see you have to use way or manner john's behavior uh, has always been rather cowardly you have to say john has always behaved in a cowardly way or manner because cowardly is only an adjective and that's it you know this kind of exercise you have to score two points minimum by the way if you score the minimum in each exercise that's not 50 percent so the minimum is really low uh, we just uh, use the minimum to ensure that you know something at least something about each part of this course then in exercise two we are moving to complex compound sentences you have to link sentences into complex or compound sentences using conjunctions in brackets so you can take the week off but you will have to finish all the paperwork first so you should use after so the thing that makes most sense is after finishing the paperwork you can take the week off or you can take the week off after you have finished all the paperwork there are many possibilities in the second one the conjunction that you should use is so that they book the tickets in advance so that they wouldn't miss the concert that would be for example the most straightforward answer he treats me like a complete stranger we did meet a few months ago so here it's about also using hypothetical expressions in addition to creating a complex sentence so he treats me like a complete stranger or, or as though we had not met a few months ago so you have to use this had not met because that's hypothetical 
expression that means that you actually did meet but he behaves as though you had not met uh, then in D, Jane has tried hard not to think about her ex spasm but she still can't think about anything else. This is already a complex sentence, but instead of but, you should use despite. So this means that you have to create a non-finite clause because despite usually takes non-finite I and G, actually always takes non-finite I and G. So despite trying hard not to think about her ex, Jane still cannot think about anything or anybody else and finally i don't believe we had such uh, we, uh, he said such thing to the boss he'll be in trouble otherwise so you should use if if he said such a thing to the boss he would be in trouble uh, why we use this combination of tenses because this is open or real conditional so there is a possibility that he said it you don't believe he said it but there's a possibility because it seems from the context that he's like a, a little bit crazy uh, as a person so you open the door for this possibility in the third exercise your task is to underline the adverbs now be very careful you are not supposed to find only adverbials read the instructions of the exercise it says adverbs this means that you are supposed to find adverbs functioning as adverbials adverbs functioning as modifiers and adverbs uh, functioning as possibly also complements of the preposition it is also possible that in one or several of these sentences you have more than one adverb so in the first one, the adverb, there's only one, and it's now. Uh, now you have to also not only underline the adverb, you have to determine its syntactic function. This one is a complement of the preposition until, until now. Uh, in the second one, Tom answered the question rather bluntly. There are actually two adverbs one is rather and the second is bluntly so bluntly is the head of the adverb phrase and it's an adverbial adjunct whereas rather is a modifier of that adverb phrase so it's a modifier of the adverb phrase and bluntly as i just mentioned is an adjunct in c uh, the ad adverb is actually moreover and it's a conjunct indeed it's such a nice day the adverb is such and it's a pre-modification of a noun phrase such a nice day go straight down the hall to rule number 132 the adverb is straight uh, and this one modifies the preposition down so it's a pre-modification of a prepositional phrase frankly i can't trust him the adverb is frankly and this one is a disjunct what you said is too strong a claim uh, the adverb is too and it modifies strong so it's pre-modification of the adjective phrase because strong is an adjective but this is all inside a noun phrase. And that's it for the third exercise. In the fourth exercise, you have exactly the same exercise that you also have in the midterm, and that's putting the adjectives in the correct order. You know that it's first uh, subjective, then objective, size, shape, age, color, etc. So, if you have a cottage that is small built, small and country, uh, country is a noun, so it will go to the end, it's a country cottage, uh, small is size, stone built is a participle, so you say small, stone built, country cottage. Scarf, that is blue, old silk and embroidered, what you know is that silk will be exactly next to the scarf because it's a noun and material, so silk scarf. 
Then you will have embroidered because it's par a participle, so embroidered silk scarf. And then since old is age and blue is color, that's the order in which they appear. Uh, first age, then color. So old blue embroidered silk scarf. When it comes to curtains and four adjectives that you have here, the first will be lovely because it's subjective. Uh, and then uh, you have size, shape, age, color, etc. So the last will be velvet because it's material. So you know that it's going to be lovely velvet curtains. The only question is whether you say long blue or blue long. Since long is, let's say, the size, a blue is the color, it, you say lovely long blue velvet curtains. Cookies uh, that are Swiss delicious chocolate and boxed, uh, you know that they are chocolate cookies because chocolate is a noun and material. Origin comes before that, so it's Swiss chocolate cookies. Then it's delicious at the beginning and boxed is a participle, so it comes before Swiss, so you say delicious boxed Swiss chocolate cookies. When it comes to pot, uh, of course, uh, for, you will have, uh, normally, you will have uh, actually iron pot, but uh, here you have an exception because pot is a cooking pot. So this is a cooking pot made of iron. So you will say it's a cooking, it's an iron cooking pot, not cooking iron pot. So that's why I say iron cooking pot and small and round. Well, there, there are no issues there. Size and then shape. So small round iron cooking pot. And we are already almost halfway through. So the fifth exercise is about choosing the right form in terms of concord and agreement. So crime and punishment is a single work of art to say it is my favorite novel. Neither the coach nor the players here use uh, actually the proximity because two conjoins of neither nor constructions are of different numbers. Coach is single, players is plural. In that case, you always follow proximity. So you are going to say players, neither the coach nor the players are satisfied. A large number of applicants is actually a big number. So in your mind, this is notional concord. This means like 10,000 people. So you say ver. So this is a notional concord, not grammatical concord. Each of the passengers, since each has a singular meaning, you have to use the singular verb. So each of the passengers goes through customs and passport control. And my favorite food is beans because the subject agrees with the verb uh, and the verb does not really agree with the complement. And that's the fifth exercise. So now we only have three additional exercises before the end of this overview of the written exam. Uh, the sixth exercise is a rather long one where you have to do transformations. So what you do here is you have the first uh, word or the first two, three words written for you. So are, you are only allowed to make a transformation in the way that you are, let's say, instructed to do. And uh, on top of that, what you have here is either the passive voice, the reported speech, the hypothetical expressions, the conditionals, all the fancy and cool stuff that you all already need to know for your everyday language use. So in the first one, it's about wishful thinking, so hypothetical expressions. I wish I starting smoking was a big mistake. I wish I hadn't started smoking. You shouldn't try to open the safe under any circumstances. So here you actually are aiming for the negative inversion. So under no circumstances, you cannot say under any, then there's no negative inversion. So 
under no circumstances should you try to open the safe. In the next one, C, uh, it's about conditionals and again hypothetical meaning. Uh, why didn't you tell me about the party? I, you knew, you know, I like going to the parties. So you can say something like, had you told me about the party, I would have gone to it, or I would have liked to go, or I would have gone, or something like that. But the important thing is this first part, had you told me about the party. But I didn't, so this is actually unreal conditional. Don't tell anyone or you'll be sorry, Mary warned her brother. This is, of course, a sport reported speech. So whenever you have the imperative in the reported speech, it becomes the infinitive. So Mary warned her brother. Here it's negated. Mary warned her brother not to tell anyone or he would be sorry. Of course, would because of the back shift. So will has to become would. They didn't expect that the book was going to be a bestseller. Little, this is a set expression, little did they suspect, not little did they know, but we would accept little did they know, little did they suspect that the book was going to be, or was going to become a bestseller. In F, the police recommended every citizen stay indoors during the riots. What we are aiming for is actually subjunctive, which has hypothetical meaning. The police recommended that every citizen stay indoors during the riots. Of course, you can also use the putative should. So the police recommended every citizen should stay indoors during the riots. Uh, G is again about reported speech. I ask Cindy and again, this is the imperative, so I asked Cindy to tell me, and then you have to do the back shift, what she had actually been doing when the lightning had struck, but we would accept struck on its own. It's impossible to win a lottery, however, I would definitely know how to spend the money. If I were to win a lottery, I would definitely know how to spend the money. And we have two more exercises, two actually more tasks in this sixth exercise. First, he was a promoted to executive manager, then he bought a very expensive car. Uh, this is about sequence of events. So you have to start with having been promoted to an executive manager. He bought a very expensive car. And finally, uh, this is specialization in J. They believe that the police recaptured the fugitive somewhere in Mexico, or Mexico. The fugitive is believed to have been recaptured somewhere in Mexico. And now, in the seventh exercise, you have an interesting task. This task is about translation, but we don't want you to do translation in the sense of a beautiful literary translation. We don't grade you on the basis of your choice of vocabulary and 100% accuracy in terminology, etc. No, what we are aiming for here is grammatical accuracy. So uh, the seventh task is always about conditional, hypothetical expressions or reported speech. So Sadbis mission a pet said an epadakisha is a hypothetical expression. It is raining, so we cannot go out uh, and fish, but we are thinking what could have been so it's wishful thinking so you have to use hypothetical expressions here and you can do it with a conditional for example if it didn't rain or maybe if it weren't raining we would go fishing now or we would be fishing now or we would fish now there are many possibilities but the whole point is for you to hit the sweet spot to pinpoint uh, the conditional or hypothetical meaning. 
Rekao mi je da će se predstaviti u novoj stan do kraja sledeće nedelje. This is actually a reported speech, so she told me that and now think what, would, what it would have been if you had uttered it as a direct speech. Normally you would say she will have moved to a new flat by the end of the next week. So will have moved becomes would have moved the next week becomes the following week so you say something like she told me that she would have moved to a new flat by the end of the following week or uh, if this period is still valid if you are still in this week if the next week hasn't started yet Theoretically, it's also okay to say she told me that she will have moved to a new flat by the end of the next week. So here there are at least two possibilities. Tek kada ga je napustila za uvek, on je shvatio koliko je voli. This is actually about the choice of, again, the right verbal constructions. This is aiming for no sooner. So no sooner had she left him. Then, spelled as T-H-A-N, he realized how much he loved her. So, that's probably the best choice. And the last one is again about reported speech. Peter, I da se stari put popravlja. Yeah, there are many other possibilities for C, but uh, she asked if the old road was being let's say repaired or reconstructed she asked whether or if the old road was being reconstructed or repaired there are now only two exercises remaining in your final written exam and the eighth exercise is about adverbials you are supposed to find and underline or circle the adverbials Determine whether they are adjuncts, disjuncts, and conjuncts, and also whether they are, uh, for example, time, place, contingency, subjunct, etc., and their position, initial, medial, final. So you have an example here. I see him twice a week. You have to say it's an adjunct of time, free, subtype, frequency in the final position. So as far as politics is concerned, as far as politics is concerned, is an adjunct of respect. In your workbook, they are merged as a single group, but there are two subtypes, so you say adjunct respect. The position is initial. All in all, they organize the great party, all in all is an adverbial but this is not an adjunct this is a conjunct and this one is summative conjunct and it's again in the initial position in spite of his hard work he failed the test so the adverbial is in spite of his hard work so this adverbial denotes that contrary to the proposition of the main sentence he failed the test it is not due to the normal chain of events he didn't study at all or he barely studied so he failed the test no he worked hard so you allow for the opposite outcome of uh, than what is normally accepted or expected so that's actually the clause of concession and the adverbial is contingency concession uh, and it's in the initial position I entirely agree with you. Uh, here you have actually two entirely and with you. These are two adverbials. Entirely uh, shows you how much I agree with you on a scale. As soon as you have a scale, it's actually an intensifier if it goes to the top most level so you will say it's an adjunct intensifier amplifier and it this one is in the medial position whereas with you 
is a little bit controversial, but you could say that it's, let's say, process manner. Uh, and it's in the final position. Uh, this is relatively open for discussion. There are multiple interpretations for the meaning of it. You could be also uh, some other group. So you will not get examples like this. What is even more remarkable, he hasn't been arrested yet. There are two adverbials. What is even more remarkable and yet the first one is your take on the fact that he hasn't been arrested yet for you it's remarkable for somebody else maybe it's not so it's subjective and it's your personal opinion on the truth value of the sentence so it's a disjunct and this is a content disjunct it's in the initial position yet is a time adjunct of other relationships and it's in the final position and that leaves us with the last ninth exercise. The ninth exercise is where everything comes together. So you are supposed to analyze the sentence in terms of sentence elements. You call, you say that like uh, svoza, and then you have to label their structure. So whether it's a phrase or a clause, if it's a clause, is it finite or non-finite? And you have to put optional adverbials in brackets. And you also have to identi uh, identify relationships of subordination and coordination. So he didn't know that I was coming. He is a noun phrase. Didn't know is a verb phrase. That I was coming is a nominal clause. Uh, he is a subject. Didn't know is a verb. And that I was coming is an object. And this nominal clause, which functions as an object, is subordinate to the main clause. In your final exam and in your midterm, this exercise asks you to fill in these gaps with S denoting structure and F denoting function. But what you have to do in the exam is always first identify sentence elements by bracketing them or circling them or doing something that clearly indicates where the boundaries of sentence elements are. So the man standing in front of you is actually the subject. Seems is a verb. Rather happy is a subject complement. And although he has just failed an exam is an adverbial. So then what you do is you write, for example, structure for the first element, the man standing in front of you. It's the man. So it's a noun phrase. The head is man and the function is the subject. Seems is a verb phrase and the verb, the verb is always realized as a verb phrase. Rather happy is a subject complement. Uh, the head is happy. So it's an adjective phrase. Uh, and it's a subject complement and although he has just failed an exam is as a structure clause but it's not enough to write a clause you have to say that it's uh, what the type of the clause is it's an adverbial clause the structure of the clause it's finite and you have to indicate that there's subordination so you write something like this adverbial clause finite subordination or you can use the arrow monodirectional to indicate subordination and then for a function you write a in brackets which indicates an optional adverbial having considered the student's request the teacher reluctantly gave them a two-week extension of the deadline again the most important thing is to identify sentence elements so the first one is having considered the student's requests uh, which is actually an adverbial. The teacher is the subject. Reluctantly is another adverbial. Gave is a verb. Then them is an indirect object. And what the teacher gave them is a two-week extension of the deadline. So a two-week extension of the deadline is a direct object. So now... For the first one, having considered student, the student's requests, you have to write the structure. It's a clause. 
but you know it's not enough. You have to say whether it's a nominal, adverbial, relative, comparative clause, etc. So this one functions as an adverbial. So uh, it's by definition then an adverbial clause. It has no subject. It starts with a participle, so it's a non-finite clause. And then you also have to identify the relationships of coordination and subordination. Since this is a subordinate clause, you write subordination or a monodirectional arrow. And uh, for F, you write A in brackets, indicating an optional adverbial. The teacher is the subject and the noun phrase. Reluctantly is an adverb phrase functioning as an optional adverbial. Uh, gave is a verb phrase functioning as the verb, as a sentence element. Uh, them is a noun phrase that has uh, the function of the indirect object. And a two-week extension of the deadline is fundamental in extension. So extension is the head, it's a noun phrase, and it's a direct object. Then in C, you have a sentence, I must admit that what he has just done is the silliest thing I've seen in years. Uh, the first sentence element is I, it's the subject, must admit is the verb. What do I mu uh, what sh must I admit? I must admit something that what he has just done is the silliest thing I've seen in years. So this whole thing is one huge object. So although this sentence looks as complex as the previous ones, it's actually simpler in terms of stru uh, its structure. So it's got I as a noun phrase, function as the subject, must admit as a verb phrase, function as a verb. And that what he has just done is the silliest thing I've seen in years is one huge clause functioning as, as an object. So since it's an object, it has to be a nominal clause. Since it has a subject and the subject agrees with the verb, uh, then it means that it's finite, and since it's functioning as an object of the main clause, it's subordinate. So you can write subordination or a monodirectional arrow, like here, nominal clause, finite, subordination, and the function is direct object. As you can see here, there are more gaps than the, uh, there are sentence elements, so don't count on the number of gaps to indicate to you how many sentence elements you have. Sometimes you have fewer, sometimes you have more. Trust your analysis. And the last sentence in the whole exercise, the written exercise, uh, sorry, the written test or the written exam is this longer one. Everybody who lives in that country must show a good deal of enthusiasm, but many people find this approach pointless. So far, you had usually complex or even simple sentences. In this one, you may encounter, so somewhere in the exercise, you may encounter also compound sentence. I told you, whenever you see and, but, or, these are conjunctions that function as coordinators and they can produce, when they operate on clauses, they can produce comp uh, compound sentences. So. Since you have but, it's probably a compound sentence. Everybody who lives in that country, they must show something. So everybody who lives in that country is the subject and it's uh, followed by must show, which is a verb. And then what they must show is the object of showing. So a good deal of enthusiasm is the object. But is a conjunction and a coordinator many people is the subject of find and then you have uh, what they find is this approach and they find that this approach is pointless so this approach is the object whereas pointless is the object complement so how you write it uh, into these pre-specified spaces for structure and function well for everybody who is in that country you simply write 
noun phrase because the head is everybody. Pronouns are heads of noun phrases, so you write MP and the function is the subject. Must show verb phrase and the verb. A good deal of enthusiasm, well, it's a noun phrase, uh, so and it functions, as we mentioned, as the direct object. But structure, conjunction, function, I just told you at the beginning, coordinator. So you can also use this same line to indicate that there is a relationship of coordination. For this, you don't use a monodirectional arrow, you can use a bidirectional arrow if you don't want to write coordination. Then you ran out of spaces and the template just gave you four, but you have more uh, than four sentence elements. Many people is the subject of the second part of the compound sentence. So NP, people is the head and function is the subject. Find, verb phrase, function, the verb, the verb. this approach. Uh, the head is approached, so it's a noun phrase, functions as a direct object, and pointless is an adjective phrase and functions as, a, as an object complement. And that's it. The end. Uh, if you look at the clock uh, or the YouTube timeline, you see that we actually did it in under 30 minutes. However, you can do it also slower. I'm not sure if you can do it faster. I'm pretty sure you can, but don't operate on time. Uh, you will have 90 minutes and of course don't rush it because you will not be allowed to go out even when you finish because for social distancing and disease prevention you will not be allowed to squeeze your way out from the row so that you pass or squeeze past your colleagues. So it can be done in 30 minutes, you will have 90 minutes. The total number of points is 51. You need 51% of correct answers to pass. So that's actually 26 points. And on top of that, if or when you pass this, uh, this written exam is valid for three consecutive examination terms. So, when you pass the exam in June, the written exam, you can take the oral exam in September and October. This year, we have a special situation, so you can also take this oral exam in July. Uh, if you pass the exam, this written exam in July, you can again do it in September and October. If you pass this in September, you can do the written, the oral exam in October or January, etc. Uh, of course, since we're talking about the oral exam, it's important for me to also say a couple words about the oral exam. So, what's probably uh, on your mind right now when I mention the words oral and exam, is why do we have the oral exam in the first place? And the most important answer is that we introduce this in a, as a way for you to get better grades. Uh, if you don't believe us, statistically, we see that actually in 90% of the cases, the oral exam has a beneficial effect on the final grade. Uh, so, if you look at the statistics, you will also see that in the previous course, GAY1, we didn't have as many tens or A's as you would have wished. And in this course, thanks to the oral exam, you can actually boost your grade. Uh, finally, the oral exam is a way uh, that the accreditation committee uh, suggested we, um, you know, improve the quality of the course. So, in the oral exam, you have three questions. Two of them are theoretical. 
one is practical uh, they can be different like analyze a sentence analyze the function of adverbs analyze semantic roles etc and normally uh, no matter what combination of questions you get, you should be able to do it and to answer them in under 10 minutes. Uh, usually between 5 and 8 minutes, but it may depend on the combination of questions. So this is one possibility. Uh, please don't print it out on a sheet of paper and try to cheat your way into answering these questions. People tried it, they failed. If you had this idea, don't do it, it's not fair. And we will notice, by the way. So proper nouns and the use of articles. You see, this is a question for from the, let's say, first semester and process adjuncts, classes, form and position, that's a question from the second semester. And in the third one, uh, your task is to study the sentences and choose the best way of expressing the future so you can come and collect it on the 18th. I will have finished it by then. Just think this time next week we will be sitting on the plane. I bought some cement because I'm going to mend the wall. You have the intention. I will retire when I'm 60. So present simple as a means of denoting future time in subordinate temporal clauses. Uh, of course, I will not answer the first and the second one. That's just memorization from lectures. Another possible combination is, let's say again, uh, you will see the same pattern, the category of number in variable nouns. You have to say something about nouns that are either singular or plural, singularia, plurality, tantum. You have to classify them. For example, you have to mention the summation, plural, also, um, you know, uh, S uh, singular nouns that denote sciences like physics, mathematics, acoustics, etc. You have to do it in, you know, in a non chaotic way, so systematically. Then, adverbial positions that's from the second semester, and here in the third one, you have the traditional passive transformation exercise that you are quite familiar with so uh, you have to also comment on these transformations just describe them then this is yet another example of um, um, an oral exam combination the verbal paradigm you have to list the five verb uh, forms uh, like the base form the um, third person single present tense form uh, the past tense form, the ing participle, the past participle form, and describe what they are used uh, for. Uh, so for actually the base form, you will have the biggest amount of discussion because the base form, sorry, is the most uh, versatile of them all. Then concord, very fresh in your memory, types of concord, grammatical, notional, proximity. You describe notional concord and proximity. You mention what happens with collective nouns like the government, especially in British English, and what happens with coordination. We discuss this. So you have proper and a positive coordination. Just give some examples and that's it. And then in the third one, you have to actually discuss the position and meaning of the underlined words. So he works hard. You will say hard is an adverb, function as an adverbial. He's had a hard life. That's actually uh, an adjective modifying the noun life. So it's a pre-modifying adjective. Hard is an adverb, function as an adverbial, and so on. That's it. We actually presented you the written and the oral exam. As you can see, there's nothing now unknown, I hope, uh, in terms of the exam, except, of course, for exactly the combination that you will get, but that's up to luck, and luck is the fairest thing of them all. Uh, the last thing that I can tell you is that uh, you should do all the exercises that we haven't done 
uh, so far. So there are about uh, a dozen exercises in the complex sentence uh, section that we haven't done. Do them alone and I will upload the key to these exercises um, in two weeks time, actually next week. And that's it. Thank you for watching these videos. I hope that they were useful and at least partially informative. See you in the exam and after the exam in the fourth year, your MA studies, if you choose courses where Olga and I teach. So that's the end of Grammar 2. Thank you. Bye.